Your Invisible Power by Genevieve Berend. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Relation Between Mental and Physical Form. Some persons feel that it is not quite proper to visualize for things. It's too material, they say. But material form is necessary for the self recognition of spirit from the individual standpoint and this is the means through which the creative process is carried forward. Therefore, far from matter being an illusion and something that ought not to be, as some metaphysical teachers have taught, matter is the necessary channel for the self-differentiation of spirit. However, it is not my desire to lead you into lengthy and tiresome scientific reasoning in order to remove the mystery of visualization and to put it upon a logical foundation. Naturally, each individual will do this in his own way. My only wish is to point out to you the smoothest way I know, which is the road on which Troward guides me. I feel sure that you will conclude, as I have, that the only mystery in connection with visualizing is the mystery of life taking form, governed by unchangeable and easily understood laws. We all possess more power and greater possibilities than we realize, and visualizing is one of the greatest of these powers. It brings other possibilities to our observation. When we pause to think for a moment, we realize that for a cosmos to exist at all, it must be the outcome of a cosmic mind, which binds all individual minds to certain generic unities of action, thereby producing all things as realities and nothing as illusions. If you will take this thought of Troward's and meditate upon it without prejudice, you will surely realize that concrete material form is an absolute necessity of the creative process. Also, that matter is not an illusion, but a necessary channel through which life differentiates itself. If you consider matter in its right order, as the polar opposite to spirit, you will not find any antagonism between them. On the contrary, together they constitute one harmonious whole. And when you realize this, you feel, in your practice of visualizing, that you are working from cause to effect, from beginning to finish. In reality, your mental picture is the specialized working of the originating spirit. One could talk for hours on purely scientific lines showing, as Troward says, that raw material for the formation of the solar systems is universally distributed throughout all space. Yet investigation shows that while the heavens are studded with millions of suns, there are spaces that show no signs of a cosmic activity. This being true, there must be something which started cosmic activity in certain places, while passing over others in which the raw material was equally available. At first thought, one might attribute the development of cosmic energy to the etheric particles themselves. Upon investigation, however, we find this to be mathematically impossible in a medium which is equally distributed throughout space, for all its particles are in equilibrium, therefore no one particle possesses in itself a greater power of originating motion than the other. Thus we find that the initial movement, though working in and through the particles of primary substance, is not the particles themselves. It is this something we mean when we speak of spirit. The same power that brought universal substance into existence will bring your individual thought or mental picture into physical form. There is no difference of kind in the power. The only difference is a difference of scale. The power and the substance themselves are the same. Only in working out your mental picture it has transferred its creative energy from the universal to the scale of the particular, and is working in the same unfailing manner from its specific center, your mind. End of chapter 3「Your Invisible Power » by Genevieve Berrin This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 – Operation of Your Mental Picture The operation of a large telephone system may be used as a simile. The main or head central subdivides itself into many branch centrals, every branch being in direct connection with its source, and each individual branch recognizing the source of its existence, reports all things to its central head. Therefore, when assistance of any nature is required, new supplies, difficult repairs to be done, or what not, the branch in need goes at once to its central head. It would not think of referring its difficulties, or its successes, to the main central of a telegraph system, 
although they belong to the same organization. These different branch centrals know that the only remedy for any difficulty must come from the central out of which they were projected. If we, as individual branches of the universal mind, would refer our difficulties in the same confident manner to the source from which we were projected, and use the remedies that it has provided, we would realize what Jesus meant when he said, Ask, and ye shall receive. Our every requirement would be met. Surely the father must supply the child. The trunk of the tree cannot fail to provide for its branches. Everything animate or inanimate is called into existence or outstandingness by a power which itself does not stand out. The power that creates the mental picture, the originating spirit substance of your pictured desire, does not stand out. It projects the substance of itself, that is a solidified counterpart of itself, while it remains invisible to the physical eye. Only those will ever appreciate the value of visualizing who are able to realize Paul's meaning when he said, the worlds were formed by the word of God. Things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. There is nothing unusual or mysterious in the idea of your pictured desire coming into material evidence. It is the working of a universal natural law. The world was projected by the self-contemplation of the universal mind, and this same action is taking place in its individualized branch, which is the mind of man. Everything in the whole world has its beginning in mind and comes into existence in exactly the same manner from the hat on your head to the boots on your feet. All are projected thoughts, solidified. Your personal advance in evolution depends upon your right use of the power of visualizing and your use of it depends on whether you recognize that you, yourself, are a particular center through and in which the originating spirit is finding ever new expression for potentialities already existing within itself. This is evolution, this continual unfolding of existing, though outwardly invisible things. Your mental picture is the force of attraction that evolves and combines the originating substance into specific shape. Your picture is the combining and evolving powerhouse, so to speak, through which the originating creative spirit expressed itself. Its creative action is limitless, without beginning and without end, and always progressive and orderly. It proceeds stage by stage, each stage being necessary preparation for the one to follow. Now let us see if we can get an idea of the different stages by which the things in the world have come to be. Troward says, if we can get at the working principle which is producing these results, we can very quickly and easily give it personal application. First, we find that the thought of originating life, or spirit, about itself is its simple awareness of its own being, and this produced a primary ether, a universal substance out of which everything in the world must grow. Troward also tells us that though this awareness of being is a necessary foundation for any further possibilities, it is not much to talk about. It is the same with individualized spirit, which is yourself. Before you would entertain the idea of making a mental picture of your desire as being at all practical, you must have some idea of your being, of your I am, and just as soon as you are conscious of your I amness, you begin to wish to enjoy the freedom which this consciousness suggests. You want to do more and be more, and as you fulfill this desire within yourself, localized spirit begins conscious activities in you. The thing you are most concerned with is the specific action of the creative spirit of life, universal mind specialized. The localized God germ in you is your personality, your individuality, and since the joy of absolute freedom is the inherent nature of this God germ, it is natural that it should endeavor to enjoy itself through its specific center. And as you grow in the comprehension that your being, your individuality, is God particularizing himself, you naturally develop divine tendencies. You want to enjoy life and liberty. You want freedom in your affairs as well as in your consciousness, and it is natural that you should. Always with this progressive wish there is a faint thought picture. As your wish and your recognition grow into an intense desire, this desire becomes a clear mental picture. For example, a young lady studying music wishes she had a piano in order to practice at home. She wants the piano so much that she can mentally see it in one of the rooms. She holds the picture of the piano and indulges in a mental reflection of the pleasure and advantage it will be to have the piano in the corner of the living room. One day she finds it there just as she had pictured it. As you grow in understanding as to who you are, 
where you came from, and what the purpose of your being is, how you are to fulfil the purpose for which you are intended, you will more and more afford a centre through which the creative spirit of life can enjoy itself, and you will realise that there can be but one creative process filling all space, which is the same in its potentiality, whether universal or individual. Furthermore, all that there is, whether on the plane of the visible or invisible, had its origin in the localised action of thought or a mental picture, and this includes yourself, because you are universal spirit localised, and the same creative action is taking place through you. Now you are no doubt asking yourself why there is so much sickness and misery in the world. If the same power and intelligence which brought the world into existence is in operation in the mind of man, why does it not manifest itself as strength, joy, health and plenty? If one can have one's desires fulfilled by simply making a mental picture of that desire, holding on to it with the will, and doing without anxiety on the outward plane whatever seems necessary to bring the desire into fulfilment, then there seems no reason for the existence of sickness and poverty. Surely no one desires either. The first reason is that few persons will take the trouble to inquire into the working principle of the laws of life. If they did, they would soon convince themselves that there is no necessity for the sickness and poverty that we see about us. They would realise that visualising is a principle and not a fallacy. There are a few who have found it worthwhile to study this simple, though absolutely unfailing law that will deliver them from bondage. However, the race as a whole is not willing to give the time required for this study. It is either too simple or too difficult. They may make a picture of their desire with some little understanding of visualising for a day or two, but more frequently it is for an hour or two. But if you will insist upon mentally seeing yourself surrounded by things and conditions as you wish them to be, you will understand that the creative energy sends its plastic substance in the direction indicated by the tendency of your thoughts. Herein lies the advantage of holding your thought in the form of a mental picture. The more enthusiasm and faith you are able to put into your picture, the more quickly it will come into visible form, and your enthusiasm is increased by keeping your desire secret. The moment you speak it to any living soul, that moment your power is weakened. Your power, your magnet of attraction is not so strong, and consequently cannot reach so far. The more perfectly a secret between your mind and outer self is guarded, the more vitality you give your power of attraction. One tells one's troubles to weaken them, to get them off one's mind, and when a thought is given out, its power is dissipated. Talk it over with yourself, and even write it down and at once destroy the paper. However, this does not mean that you should strenuously endeavour to compel the power to work out your picture on the special lines that you think it should. That method would soon exhaust you, and hinder the fulfilment of your purpose. A wealthy relative need not necessarily die, or someone lose a fortune on the street to materialise the $10,000 that you are mentally picturing. One of the doormen in the building in which I live heard much of the mental picturing of desires from visitors passing out of my rooms. The average desire was for $500. He considered that $5 was more in his line and began to visualise it, without the slightest idea of where or how he was to get it. My parrot flew out of the window, and I telephoned to the men in the courtyard to get it for me. One caught it, and it bit him on the finger. The doorman, who had gloves on, and did not fear a similar hurt, took hold of it and brought it up to me. I gave him five one-dollar bills for the service. This sudden reward surprised him. He enthusiastically told me that he had been visualising for just five dollars, merely from hearing that others visualised. He was delighted at the unexpected realisation of his mental picture. All you have to do is to make such a mental picture of your heart's desire, hold it cheerfully in place with your will, always conscious that the same infinite power which brought the universe into existence brought you into form for the purpose of enjoying itself in and through you. And since it is all life, love, light, power, peace, beauty and joy, and is the only creative power there is, the form it takes in and through you depends upon the direction given it by your thought indicator. In you it is undifferentiated, waiting to take any direction given it, as it passes through the instrument that it has made for the purpose of self-distribution. It is this power which enables you to transfer your thoughts from one form to another. The power to change your mind is the individualised universal power taking the initiative giving direction to the fluent substance contained in every thought. 
It is the simplest thing in the world to give this highly sensitive plastic substance any form you will through visualising. Anyone can do it with a small expenditure of effort. Once you really believe that your mind is a centre through which the plastic substance of all there is in your world takes involuntary form, the only reason why your picture does not always materialise is because you have introduced something antagonistic to the fundamental principle. Very often this destructive element is caused by the frequency with which you change your pictures. After many such changes you decide that your original desire is what you want after all. Upon this conclusion you begin to wonder why, being your first picture, it hasn't materialised. The plastic substance with which you are mentally dealing is more sensitive than the most sensitive photographer's film. If, in taking a picture, you suddenly remember that you had already taken a picture on that same plate, you would not expect the perfect result of either picture. On the other hand, you may have taken two pictures on the same plate unconsciously. When the plate has been developed and the picture comes into physical view, you do not condemn the principle of photography, nor are you puzzled to understand why your picture has turned out so unsatisfactorily. You do not feel that it is impossible for you to obtain a good, clear picture of the subject in question. You know that you can do so by simply starting at the beginning, putting in a new plate and determining to be more careful while taking your picture next time. These lines followed out, you are sure of a satisfactory result. If you will proceed in the same manner with your mental picture, doing your part in a correspondingly confident frame of mind, the result will be just as perfect. The laws of visualising are as infallible as the laws governing photography. In fact, photography is the outcome of visualising. Again, your results in visualising and your desires may be imperfect or delayed through the misuse of this power, owing to the thought that the fulfilment of your desire is contingent upon certain persons or conditions. The originating principle is not in any way dependent upon any person, place or thing. It has no past and knows no future. The law is that the originating creative principle of life is the universal here and everlasting now. It creates its own vehicles through which to operate. Therefore, past experience has no bearing upon your present picture. So do not try to obtain your desire through a channel that may not be natural for it, even though it may seem reasonable to you. Your feeling should be that the thing, or the consciousness which you so much desire, is normal and natural, a part of yourself, a form for your evolution. If you can do this, there is no power to prevent your enjoying the fulfilment of the picture you have in hand, or any other. End of chapter 4「Your Invisible Power » by Genevieve Berend This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 – Expressions from Beginners Hundreds of persons have realised that visualising is an Aladdin's lamp to him with a mighty will. General Foch says that his feelings were so outraged during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 that he visualised himself leading a French army against the Germans to victory. He said he made his picture, smoked his pipe, and waited. This is one result of visualising we are all familiar with. A famous actress wrote a long article in one of the leading Sunday papers last winter describing how she rid herself of excessive body fat and weight by seeing her figure constantly as she wished it to be. A very interesting letter came to me from a doctor's wife while I was lecturing in New York. She began with the hope that I would never discontinue my lectures on visualisation, making humanity realise the wonderful fact that they possess the method of liberation within themselves. Relating her own experience, she said that she had been born on the east side of New York in the poorest quarter. From earliest girlhood, she had cherished a dream of marrying a physician some day. This dream gradually formed a stationary mental picture. The first position she obtained was in the capacity of a nursemaid in a physician's family. Leaving this place, she entered the family of another doctor. The wife of her employer died, and in time the doctor married her, the result of her long pictured yearning. After that, both she and her husband conceived the idea of owning a fruit farm in the south. They formed a mental picture of the idea and put their faith in its eventual fulfilment. The letter she sent me came from their fruit farm in the south. It was while at the farm that the doctor's wife wrote me. Her second mental picture had seen the light of materialization. Many letters of a similar nature come to me every day. The following is a case that was printed in the New York Herald last May. 
Atlantic City, May 5th. She was an old woman, and when she was arraigned before Judge Clarence Goldenberg in the police court today, she was so weak and tired she could hardly stand. The judge asked the court attendant what she was charged with. Stealing a bottle of milk, Your Honour, repeated the officer. She took it from the doorstep of a downtown cottage before daybreak this morning. Why did you do that? Judge Goldenberg asked her. I was hungry, the old woman said. I didn't have a cent in the world, and no way to get anything to eat except to steal it. I did not think anyone would mind if I took a bottle of milk. What's your name? asked the judge. Weinberg, said the old woman. Elizabeth Weinberg. Judge Goldenberg asked her a few questions about herself. Then he said, Well, you're not very wealthy now, but you're no longer poor. I've been searching for you for months. I've got $500 belonging to you from the estate of a relative. I'm the executor of the estate. Judge Goldenberg paid the woman's fine out of his own pocket and then escorted her into his office, where he turned the legacy over to her and sent a policeman out to find her a lodging place. I learned later that this little woman had been desiring and mentally picturing $500, while all the time ignorant of how it could possibly come to her, but she kept her vision and strengthened it with her faith. In the recent edition of Good Housekeeping, there was an article by Addington Bruce entitled, Stiffening Your Mental Backbone. It is very instructive and would benefit anyone to read it. He says, in part, Form the habit of devoting a few moments every day to thinking about your work in a large, broad, imaginative way, as a vital necessity to yourself and a useful service to society. Huntington, the great railway magnate, before he started building his road from coast to coast, said that he took hundreds of trips all along the line before there was a rail laid. It was said that he would sit for hours with a map of the United States before him and mentally travel from coast to coast, just as we do now, over his fulfilled mental picture. It would be possible to call your attention to hundreds of similar cases. The best method of picturing to yourself that which you may desire is both simple and enjoyable, if you once understand the principle back of it well enough to believe it. First, and above everything else, be sure of what it is you really want. Then specialise your desire along these lines. End of chapter 5